Hello everyone! Today we'll dive into a movie that tells the tale of Michael Myers, a psychopath and murderer, starting from the time when he was just 10 years old. This character has become an iconic figure in modern pop culture and a cornerstone of classic horror cinema. Director Rob Zombie chose to meticulously portray the evolution of this maniac's personality. He immerses the audience into the life of a troubled teenager growing up in a dysfunctional family, a journey that eventually shapes him into the very embodiment of absolute evil. So get comfy and prepare for a spooky ride. This movie opens with a quote from the film's character Dr. Loomis, saying that the darkest souls aren't the ones who live in hell, but the ones who move silently among humans. The next scene takes us to the Myers' home in Haddonfield, Illinois on October 31st. Up on the second floor, a young boy sporting a rather eerie clown mask is carrying his pet rat Elvis somewhere. Meanwhile in the kitchen, his parents are having a heated argument. It's quite clear that this family is dysfunctional. The dad, Ronnie, is a crippled alcoholic. The mom, Deborah, makes a living as a middle-aged stripper. Their older daughter, Judith, is a rebellious and promiscuous teenager. The only one who comes off as a normal kid is Angel, Michael's younger sister. While Angel's crying, the parents throw a barrage of profanities at each other. <laughs> Just then, Judith enters the kitchen. Deborah sends her upstairs to get her brother. Ronnie, the head of the family, makes a sleazy comment about his daughter. At his wife's outrage, he just says that she's feeling jealous of her own kid. That makes Deborah really mad. <laughs> While the parents are having an argument, Michael, with a clown mask on, is stubbornly keeping the door closed, not letting his sister in. He's cleaning the scalpel he just used to dissect his rat in the sink. Finally, the boy agrees to join everyone for breakfast. The dad senses that something's off with Michael, but he doesn't make any effort to help him. Instead, he belittles and ridicules his own child. Michael tells his mom about his pet's demise, which is why he stayed upstairs. Deborah assures him they'll get him a new rat, while the sister and Ronnie keep on teasing him. The scene concludes with a man ripping off the clown mask from Michael's face. You are starting to annoy me, boy. I hate you. He promises to beat his son as soon as his arm heals. The next scene takes us to the school where Michael goes. He is bullied in the restroom by two high school students. One of them shows a brochure for a strip club with Michael's naked mom and threatens to make copies for the whole school. Hey! Meanwhile, the school principal walks into the restroom and tries to stop the fight, but Michael angrily snaps at him. After that, Deborah is called to the school. In the principal's office, she attempts to shift the blame onto the teachers, but the principal points out that the core issue is with her son. He brings in a psychologist named Dr. Loomis. He tells Deborah that Michael is grappling with significant psychological issues due to his history of being cruel to animals and displaying aggressive behavior. Although Deborah remains skeptical, the doctor presents solid evidence. He reveals a dead cat and a stack of photos depicting other animals that have been brutally tortured. Astonishingly, all these disturbing items were found in her son's backpack. God, oh, this is really sick. Michael, seizing the opportunity, makes his escape. He grabs a clown mask and a bag from his locker. He then follows the boy who tormented him in the school restroom. As the bully goes into a secluded forest area, Michael swings a hefty tree branch into the boy's knees. He keeps hitting him until the bully collapses onto the dry leaves. Finally, Michael reveals his face to the victim before pulling the mask back on and delivering the final fatal blows. <laughs> After this brutal episode, Michael casually lets go of the branch and heads back home. Once there, he finds his father engrossed in a horror movie. Ronnie keeps on with his disrespectful comments directed at his son. This time, he chooses to mock Michael's sadistic inclinations. The barrage of offensive language and spiteful teasing gets cut short by Deborah. Michael asks his mom if he can go trick-or-treating. Initially hesitant due to Michael's cruelty towards the animals, his mom eventually lets him go. She asks Judith to go along with him. However, the girl chooses not to, instead going to her room with her boyfriend. Michael finds himself alone outside, just sitting on the curb, gazing sadly into the distance. Meanwhile, his mom is working her shift, lap dancing for a random stranger. His dad, a bit tipsy, dozes off in a chair, and his older sister is busy with her boyfriend. Judith's boyfriend brings along this eerie mask of a pale, dark-haired guy. He puts it on and has fun with his girlfriend. Open. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ronnie dozes off in front of the TV after having a bit too much to drink. Michael walks into the kitchen and spends some time there just munching on candy. Then he takes out a knife and some sturdy duct tape from a drawer. He goes over to where Ronnie is sleeping, carefully ties him up and tapes his mouth. 
Then he swiftly slits the man's throat and calmly watches as the man's life slips away. Of course, he's wearing his favorite clown mask while doing all of this. As Michael kills his own father, Judith casually slips on her headphones while her boyfriend heads downstairs to grab some food. Michael doesn't show him any mercy, swinging a hefty baseball bat and landing multiple forceful blows on the poor guy's head and body. Michael drops the bat on the floor and decides to go after Judith. He catches up with her in her room and stabs her 17 times. The boy kills his sister when she is trying to crawl away in the hallway. Michael spares his younger sister Angel. He just kisses her and wishes her a happy Halloween. When the mother returns from her shift, she sees Michael sitting on the curb in front of the house, wearing his mask. He's silent, and the sound of approaching sirens can be heard in the distance. It was described by police as Manson like its viciousness and more horrific than any there's a TV report detailing the brutal mass murder, and the boy gets admitted to Smith's Grove Sanitarium for treatment. The trial of the teenage killer goes on for 11 months. Present at the trial is psychologist Samuel Loomis, who conducts regular sessions with Michael in the hospital, all recorded on camera. During these conversations, the young psychopath claims to have no memory of committing the murders and denies any guilt. Michael's mother pays him a visit. The boy talks to her in a perfectly normal manner, displaying no hints of insanity or hostility. As time goes by, a local janitor, played by Danny Trejo, attempts to strike up a friendship with Michael. He affectionately refers to the teenager as Mikey and feels genuinely sorry for the kid, as he himself was once incarcerated, though in an actual prison. You don't learn to live inside your head. Hey, there's no walls that can stop you there. The sessions with Dr. Loomis continue. Michael shows the psychiatrist his homemade masks. He calls them a way to hide his secrets. The boy's favorite color is black, and he only shows his face during visits from his mother. At one of these meetings, he shows Deborah his new mask and won't take it off. The boy says he makes masks to hide his real face and ugliness behind them. I believe that these masks have begun to create a mental sanctuary in which Michael can hide within himself and from himself. As time passes, Michael finds himself increasingly distant mentally, and he's not engaging much with people around him. This concerns Dr. Loomis, but he can't do anything about it. During another session, Michael shouts at the doctor and insists that they let him go. Eventually, he breaks down in tears, sinking back into a daze. According to Dr. Loomis, Michael is on the brink of losing his sanity. The psychiatrist desperately asks his higher-ups for permission to conduct a session outside, giving it one more shot at helping the young man. But Michael becomes silent and refuses to take off his mask. The only thing he says repeatedly is that he just wants to go home. During his mom's visit, he avoids revealing his face and ignores her pleas to start eating. Whenever Deborah tries to make eye contact, the boy asks for his mask to be put back on. Dr. Loomis believes he's becoming less and less human. Before leaving, his mother gives Michael an old photo of him holding Angel. The doctor offers to accompany Deborah to her car. A nurse comes into the room to keep an eye on the young psycho. Taking advantage of the nurse facing away, Michael quickly takes a fork and stabs her in the neck. As the woman dies on the floor, Michael stares at her indifferently. The mother and the doctor rush to the noise. The woman tries to remove her son's mask, but the boy starts to yell. Finally, the psychopath is locked in his holding cell. Deborah comes back home, unable to come to terms with what happened. She watches old videotapes of her son over and over again. At a certain point, she can't take it anymore. So she puts the barrel of a revolver in her mouth and... <laughs> to the screams of her youngest daughter, she leaves this world. The story resumes 15 years later. We watch as two orderlies casually walk down the clinic corridor heading to Michael's cell. You might recognize one of them played by Trejo from an earlier scene. He's got just three more months until retirement and he's taking a moment to brief the new orderly. At his desk, Michael sits in silence, making new masks, as if he's entered a strange haze. The orderlies find him in this state. Hey, 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 don't touch those. The senior orderly asks the newbie not to touch the masks hanging on the walls, but his buddy isn't too concerned and fearlessly begins to mock Michael. What do you mean you're sorry about these chains? Handcuffed Michael is taken to the session with Dr. Loomis. The doctor hasn't been able to get the psychopath to say a single word in the past 15 years. He tells his patient that he can't help him and leaves. I have to move on. I'm sorry. Michael doesn't seem to be moved by his words. He continues to sit motionless, chained to the chair. 
Turns out Dr. Loomis wrote a book about Michael. The doctor called it The Devil's Eyes and described his patient as pure evil incarnate. Behind these eyes one finds only blackness. On that very night, two orderlies are on duty at the clinic. One of them was briefed by Trejo's character earlier. They plan to sneak into a room where a female patient has recently been admitted, thinking of having their way with her. Eventually, they decide to do it in Michael's room. Once inside, these troublemakers begin their despicable actions. While one of them gets busy with the girl, the other starts provoking the towering giant who hasn't spoken in 15 years. The orderlies destroy his masks and do repulsive things. Suddenly, the grim figure rises from his chair, grabs one of the wrongdoers by the neck and hurls him forcefully into the wall. The second orderly tries to help his pal and starts beating Michael on the back with his baton. However, the psychopath does not react in any way. He throws the first victim on his desk and takes on the second attacker. Sometime later, a senior orderly arrives at the clinic and sees the aftermath of the massacre. Michael spared no one. He brutally killed all the guards and staff. When the old man sees the killer, the guy stands motionless and lets himself be handcuffed. But then he suddenly grabs the orderly by the neck and throws him into the back room. He starts off by practically drowning the dude in the sink, leaving him half dead. Then to finish him off, he hurls a TV right at the guy's head. When the police arrive at the scene, Michael is long gone. The head of the clinic calls Dr. Loomis. He rushes to the clinic right away. While all this is happening, Michael makes his way to a warehouse. Just then a truck driver named Grizzly shows up. Seizing the opportunity, the psychopath traps him in the restroom, swiftly takes away the victim's knife, and fatally injures him. Afterward, he takes off the victim's overalls and shoes and changes into them. In his new guise, Michael continues his bloody journey. The next scene takes us to Haddonfield, the psychopath's hometown. Locals say that the old Myers family house is believed to hold all sorts of evil. It's October 31st. Everyone is bustling with preparations for Halloween celebrations. We see the morning routine of a schoolgirl named Lori and her family. Her mom makes scrambled eggs. Her dad takes a seat at the table, and Lori lightens up the atmosphere with a couple of cheeky jokes before heading to school. On her way, she encounters Tommy, the boy she babysits. At this time, Michael gets to his old house and opens his secret stash. He pulls out his trademark pale man mask and immediately puts it on. The psychopath's sinister face is illuminated by the scarce light that enters the house. At that very moment, Lori and Tommy approach the Myers' old home. The girl wants to scare her young friend and goes to the building, which the locals have nicknamed the Devil's House, where the boogeyman lives. Lori shoves paper into the mail slot and returns to the boy. Lori's dad is a realtor, and Myers' house is put up for sale. That's why he asked his daughter to drop off the papers on her way. The whole time, Michael is watching the two. The next scene takes place at school. Three friends, Annie, Lori, and Linda, are discussing plans for the evening. Linda wants to sneak out to meet a guy at the Myers' house of horrors. While she is telling the other girls her plan, on a nearby street, Michael is watching them closely. Linda spots him, but he quickly disappears. Hammered. Yeah. Halloween plans are set for Annie as well, as she wants to spend it with her boyfriend, Paul. Lori is supposed to babysit Tommy, and she agrees to take care of Lindsay Wallace too, so that Annie could set up a date in the empty Wallace house. In the quiet town, nobody suspects a thing, but Dr. Loomis, along with two other doctors, is on a mission to track down the psychopath. One of his companions is the owner of the clinic where Michael was held. Loomis holds his colleagues responsible for the incident, while they try to pin the blame on the guards. Frustrated, Loomis storms off, calling them idiots and urging them to report the matter to the authorities. He also points out to his colleagues that the likely hiding spot of Michael is in Haddonfield. Strangely, the men haven't put two and two together on this obvious point. Dr. Loomis believes that Myers has gone there to find his younger sister. Meanwhile, school is over and Lori and Linda head home. On the way, the girls discuss the cheerleaders. A little later, Annie catches up with them. As they walk down the street, the schoolgirls see Myers standing in the middle of the road. Hey, my daddy's the sheriff. Huh? Why don't you go crawl back under your fucking rock? Annie defiantly shoes him off, shouting about being the sheriff's daughter. Once Michael is out of sight, Annie's father drives up to them in his police car. She jumps in and they head back home, while Lori and Linda continue their stroll. At a certain point, the two of them go their own ways, and Lori begins to feel uneasy. She keeps checking her surroundings, as if she has a feeling she's being watched. Her fear subsides when she arrives home. Her mom is putting up a skeleton for the holiday, and Michael is watching it all from a distance. The next scene begins at the cemetery, where Dr. Loomis arrives. 
He gives the sheriff a call and walks around with the groundskeeper among the graves. Instead of one of the tombstones, they stumble upon a coyote crucified on a cross. Loomis has a pretty good guess about who's buried there. On Halloween night, Linda and her boyfriend arrive at the Myers house. They head upstairs and the couple's having a great time. At a certain point, Linda asks her boyfriend to grab another can of beer. However, when he checks the fridge in his van, he only finds a stack of empty cans. Putting on a ghost costume, the guy goes back inside the house and that's when Myers catches him. Afterward, Michael puts on his victim's costume and heads to Linda's room. The psychopath gives her the beer can and the girl turns her back on him. Taking advantage of the moment, the maniac grabs Linda by the throat. As the girl faints, Michael picks her up and takes her to an unknown location. Right then, Dr. Loomis reaches the store and buys himself a big revolver. Meanwhile, Lori leaves her parents' house with Annie to babysit Tommy. While Lori is away from the house, Michael goes there and brutally murders her father. He then attacks Lori's mother. The woman doesn't have time to call the police. In the meantime, the psychopath looks at Lori's picture in one of the frames. While these terrible events unfold at Lori's house, she's busy making dinner for Tommy, the boy she's babysitting. The kid bombards her with questions about the boogeyman, a spooky tale that's a hot topic at school. Just then, Lori gets a call from Annie, who announces she'll soon drop off her boyfriend's little sister. Lindsay, meanwhile, is glued to an old horror movie on TV, the same one Michael's dad was watching when Michael killed him. The room is dimly lit, and the girl is unaware that Myers is standing behind her silently. When Annie enters the room, the maniac disappears somewhere. Across town, the sheriff meets with Dr. Loomis. The psychiatrist tries to explain to the officer what happened, but the sheriff is not particularly worried. The coyote and the missing tombstone don't sound convincing to him, and no murders have been reported yet. Loomis insists it's a matter of life and death, but the sheriff invites him to come back the next day. The doctor argues that a lot of bad things can happen before tomorrow. Annie brings Lindsay over to Lori's house. The kids watch TV and the sheriff's daughter hurriedly leaves to meet Paul. Meanwhile at the station, Loomis tries to convince the sheriff that his concerns are real. The policeman has read the doctor's book and refuses to believe him. He thinks it's all an elaborate PR campaign. However, Loomis convinces him that Michael has come back for his sister and is planning something bad. The sheriff tries to call Lori's parents, but no one picks up the phone. Yeah, this is Sheriff Brackett, hello? If you can hear me pick up. The men decide to go and find out what's going on. Annie and Paul show up at the vacant Wallace residence to have a good time there together. Right in the midst of the most romantic moment of their evening, Michael stealthily enters the room. He grabs the guy by his hair and kills him. Annie screams as she desperately attempts to flee from the psychopath. However, Myers manages to grab hold of her and drag her back into the house. Annie tries to defend herself with a knife, but Michael hits her in the face and she collapses to the floor. Despite her attempt to crawl away, Michael grabs her by the leg and drags her towards the back of the house. <laughs> Unaware of what's going on, Tommy, Lindsay, and Lori are watching a movie on TV at home. It comes time for Lindsay to go, and Lori decides to walk her home. Tommy is left alone. While all of this is happening, Sheriff Brackett and Dr. Loomis are in a police car, heading over to the Strodes, Lori's parents' house. The sheriff reveals that he was the one who got a call about Deborah Meyer's suicide. When he got there, he found Michael's little sister. He left her at a hospital in another town without leaving any info. He never put that bit in the report and figured that was the end of it. But turns out the Strodes went ahead and adopted the girl, naming her Lori. As Lindsay and Lori show up at the Wallace residence, they discover an injured Annie lying on the floor. Michael quietly shuts the door after his new prey and moves towards her. Seeing the blood, Lindsay rushes to call for help. Lori phones the police, and Annie yells to alert her that Michael is close. The psycho gets to Lori and pushes her. The girl runs outside and starts calling for help. Through the empty streets, she runs back to Tommy and locks herself in his house. Lindsay is also there. Myers catches up with Lori and manages to break into the house. That's when the police finally show up. The kids have locked themselves in the upstairs bathroom and are refusing to open the door even for the police officer. The second cop decides to search the rest of the house. The officers don't find anyone and ask the kids to unlock the door. Just as Lori hurries to unlock it, Myers suddenly stabs the cop in the back. The policeman slumps down the semi-transparent glass door, bleeding.
Michael bursts through the door without any hesitation, and even a gunshot from the other officer doesn't stop him. When the maniac is done with the officers, he grabs Lori and carries her off to an unknown destination. Meanwhile, the sheriff and the psychiatrist enter the Wallace house and find a wounded Annie on the floor. Tommy and Lindsay come running in too. The kids tell them that they saw the boogeyman. Dr. Loomis sends them to safety and runs off to find Michael without waiting for Brackett. Lori wakes up in her old house on the floor. Linda's breathless body is also lying there. Michael enters the premises and heads towards Lori. At one point, Myers drops his knife and pulls out an old photo. It shows him and his younger sister. However, the girl doesn't recognize anyone in the photo. Then Michael takes off his mask and sits on his knees. Lori pretends she wants to help him, carefully reaches for the knife, grabs it, and stabs it into her brother's shoulder. You the wound doesn't stop Michael completely, but it does give Lori some time to run outside. The girl sprints a few yards and tumbles into an empty swimming pool filled with dried leaves. That's when the psychopath catches up with her. Dr. Loomis shows up and tries to get Michael to stop what he's doing. He fires shots at Michael's shoulders and back. It's only the third shot that finally brings the giant down to the bottom of the pool. Dr. Loomis takes the girl away and tries to calm her down. He puts her in the police car. As soon as the doctor gets in the driver's seat, Michael appears out of nowhere, breaks the passenger window, and takes Lori with him into the house. Loomis catches up with them and tries to convince the maniac to let the girl go. Michael, it's my fault. I failed you. Please let her go. Michael charges towards the psychiatrist, gripping his head and gouging his eyes. Using this opportunity, Lori dashes inside the house. The maniac carries the unconscious body of Loomis into one of the rooms. Trembling in the corner, Lori tries not to make a sound. As Michael searches for Lori, the girl grabs Loomis's gun. While the psycho walks past the doctor's body, he clutches his leg, trying to slow him down. Just then, the maniac's sister makes her way to the attic. Using a massive piece of wood, Michael punches holes in the ceiling. Eventually, Lori tumbles onto the floor of the second story, right in front of the balcony. It's there that her brother finds her and rushes toward her. Lori regains consciousness and shoots him in the head. Right when the psychopath grabs Lori's arm, she fires the gun. The girl, all bloody, screams, and then the scene fades out. Unlike the original movie, which mostly focuses on teenage victims, Rob Zombie's remake explores the main character's personality and the events that made him into who he is. The actor who portrayed Michael Myers in the 2007 version of Halloween stands at an impressive 6 feet 8 inches tall, making him the tallest actor to take on this role. This record holder is none other than wrestler Tyler Mayne, who also played Sabretooth in X-Men in 2000. While the story was indeed gloomy, fellow actors often blamed Malcolm McDowell, who took on the role of Loomis, for making them laugh and messing up takes. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and click on the notification bell so you never miss our latest videos. In the comments, tell us your favorite classic slasher villain. Let's determine the ultimate fan favorite.